just so like, this so, so like down. Down. great well welcome glad you've you've joined us we'll start presently we're still waiting for a couple of the other panelists to join uh, yes okay great how are you how are you doing very well thanks yeah how are you fine thanks yeah. Yeah. working online it's such a such a boring and such stressful like it's you know i'm just waiting to finish all of these things <laughs> and to be yeah, with people you know for real <laughs> and for us this is one of yeah the biggest community ever last time was 2019 so full of yeah. people you know new connections here sure. is difficult but still frank is keeping cold and uh, strong so yeah it's he's, good. Done, um, he's done a great job of keeping the momentum going. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. Yeah. So, but yeah, it was, I remember the it was it was a sad day when you know obviously for all, all the right reasons and it was the right decision to cancel the meeting in Portugal a year ago. But um, but it was around this time that 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 decision had to be taken. And it just uh, mm -hmm. it's like it's been a long long yeah. journey. We thought this summer will be finished everything, but it looks like, uh, especially in Europe, we, yeah, in decision making, we, we need much more time than uh, the other countries. So it looked like, yeah, maybe till September or end of this year, still people will not get vaccinated. So we'll have still problems in, uh, you know, traveling and meeting each other. But hope we'll have, a, I hate the new normal, but a normal life. <laughs> yeah, more, more normal anyway than exactly <laughs> exactly because i think that we people tend to forget i passed covid on um, the beginning of december hmm. and it looks to me like it was you know two years before because i don't want even to remember those two weeks they were quite yeah. uh, you know, quite difficult so i do believe that once we pass this we'll forget and we'll simply go to our routine so yeah. This has its own pluses and minuses because it we don't need to get. <laughs> yeah. We need uh, yeah, to take actions, not to repeat ourselves again in our mistakes. Um, yeah. Agreed. Agreed. Yeah, I think similar here. It'll be the summer at least um, before, uh, you know, well, probably into the fall before it gets back to a you know, reasonable level of normalcy. Well, the respect, it's gotten better, at least where I live here in the States. It's gotten better. People are feeling a little, I think people have taken more precautions recently, but you know, they're getting vaccinated, so that's no good. So we will uh, we'll wait a few more minutes uh, yeah. just to make sure that people coming from other sessions have had time to show up and uh, and then the rest of our panel, panelists show up. Excellent, great. So if people don't show up, we'll deal with this philosophical theme in, I don't know, how much? For 45 minutes? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> <what we'll... laughs> I was, you know, this time I was giving Frank, I said, okay, just put me whenever you, you know, um, yeah. find feasible because for me, for me it's okay. And then I was written and saying, damn, well then, you know, it's kind of a... Yeah, more <laughs> philosophical than, you know, practical, but still, okay, it's yeah. a good point, indeed, yeah, but, uh, yeah, I was 17 years um, working in banking system, so 
purely professional and then four years in higher politics as deputy prime minister and then MP and suddenly you see you know when you are out of politics you are saying yeah, once I enter in politics I will make the change but when you are in politics and yeah you see how much is difficult to make a change especially yeah. if you are you know uh, yeah, your own ideas you are free in judging and free on uh, say things how much is difficult to really push the agenda further <laughs> Yeah, indeed. I, it, it was an interesting topic. I, I was, um, he always, uh, Frank always does a great job of coming up with unconventional topics for these, these sessions. Yeah, that's uh, <laughs> true. And this one certainly is. And it's, um, but it's interesting because the, you know, if you look at the panelists, it's a, it's a good cross section of people who yeah, uh, I saw it, yeah. and come at it from a different perspective. But, uh, exactly. Yeah. The, la the last one of these I was on, it was, it was a panel about ethics. Which was really good ethics in this sort of disconnected world. Um, it was really interesting. I was um, it had you know people of faith. It had people like myself who work in technology and security and defense. And it was just a, a all the different range of perspectives on what ethics means to different communities. And I actually got a lot out of it. So. But right now we're. we're 12.35 and we're missing a couple of panelists. <laughs> a couple, yeah. <laughs> well, I suppose three, four, four, four more or three more. Yeah, they're supposed to be, well, I, I don't know if Ahmad is, is on. Uh, I, I know he was, he, uh, he, he was on earlier or his, uh, his assistant, uh, his oh, was on. Um, so I'm not sure, obviously don't see him, but then there are two others, uh, Libby Schaff and Vanilla Turk. Um, who are not who have not shown yet. So we'll just okay. we'll give it a few more minutes and then we can right. figure out what we want to do. But uh, <laughs> so are you do you still reside in Albania? Pardon? Do you still live in Albania? Yeah yeah. And in yeah. Albania. Capital city of Tirana. Okay. Still <laughs> we are live actually or no i think yes so we are yes. active so whomever likes to see and join they we are already live so they can hear and then they can um, yeah yeah they can hear us i mean there's i think there's only one other person on the call right now Not yeah i saw i saw Let's wait and then let's see. Yeah, we'll wait a few more minutes and then. So for those who have joined, we're still waiting for a couple of participants. Uh, so we're going to give it a couple more minutes um, and then we'll jump in with uh, the individuals who, who are here. Okay. Well, we're, we're getting close to the 1240. So I, I think it makes sense um, to go ahead and, and start so we can at least get something uh, out of this and hope that some of our panelists and other uh, attendees join. Um, uh, I guess he's off. <laughs> Having some technical difficulties as well as getting people here. So, 
but I do think might as well uh, at least uh, jump into the topic and go for a few minutes, uh, get your perspectives. Um, so this session is on getting beyond power politics narratives for a trust-centered world. My name is Tate Nurkin. I'm an analyst and consultant on defense, security, and geopolitical issues, and a resident, a, a non-resident senior fellow uh, at the Brent Scowcroft Center for Strategy and Security at the Atlantic Council. Um, very honored to be ch uh, chairing this session, moderating this session. I think it's a really interesting, and, and Sunita and I were just talking before the session started, a pretty esoteric topic, pretty conceptual topic, but I think also very relevant and very timely um, and very important, given that if you just do a survey of global geopolitics, you see a sort of an increase in, in competition, confrontation, and, and I think also mistrust, and I think that it also applies to several polities and societies and states around the world, particularly, I would say, definitely applies here in the United States, and this is an really extraordinary meeting on the U.S., although we've certainly covered other parts of the world in this uh, in this session. So I do think that there's a lot of ground to cover, uh, and we are very fortunate to have uh, panelists with us today who are uh, outstanding and, and enormously accomplished. Um, Sunita Messi, a member of parliament, former deputy prime minister of Albania. Uh, Ahmad Wali Massoud, the chairman of the Massoud Foundation in Afghanistan, who has pumped in and out of the session. <laughs> um, uh, and then hopefully we will have Libby Schaaf, the mayor of Oakland, California, and Danilo Kirk, the former president of Slovenia. Um, if, if it is just a small form of people, then we probably won't go the whole time, but I think it is useful since we've all taken the time to be here to at least um, inject some ideas on this discussion of getting beyond po power politics. And uh, Sunita, so, since you are the one who uh, was here first, <laughs> online, um, Thank you very much. Thank you. And where this goes, and again, it probably will not take up the whole a lot of time, but at least we can throw some ideas out there. Yep. So uh, thank you, dear, for the for the introduction. And indeed, it's a very coherent and actual theme what we are discussing. Once uh, I received, you know, and I was asked to to speak in this panel, then definitely I was thinking and reading a little bit. Okay, what's uh, what I'm going to say today in this uh, in this panel? Having my experience, my long experience as a professional in banking system from one side, and which you, yeah, you. You have your own core values, the core values of your own corporation, and definitely you are you are bounding yourself to this, let's say, um, uh, to these values. Meanwhile, entering in politics uh, recently, I think um, four years in high politics, but eight years even in local politics. Uh, definitely, I can see uh, I can see the, the the change, and I can see what you really uh, think that you can do from outside of politics, and what really you can push harder to change, even a little bit, even tiny things. Once you are in um, in in politics, and um, yeah, what I wanted to share with even uh, other members of uh, of the panels and the one that will join uh, or can join us. Uh, I was thinking that, yeah, uh, Epitectus, a Greek philosopher, was saying that you are a citizen of universe. And when thinking this, then humanity and surviving has to do with uh, embarrassing more visionary ways of thinking, more visionary uh, decision making, with more focus on uh, humanity and environmental issues, and finding a better and sustainable ways of living, producing, generating food, etc. So, yes, it's much more, let's say, people-oriented, human-oriented, and trusted-oriented worlds where people and surrounding environment need to, to prevail. When I'm thinking of this, then definitely you are not thinking about boundaries, you are not thinking about nations, and uh, at least not thinking in politics in the traditional way of thinking and doing politics. Meanwhile, when thinking of politics and reading even the dictionary, it shows to you that, yeah, politics is the, I'm quoting, the activity of the government, member of lawmaking organization, and people who try to influence the way of a country is governed, or the art or science concerned with winning and holding control over a government. So here we see completely, let's say, two poles or two sides 
of uh, thinking and doing and taking the decisions. So basically, when you're you, when you are in politics and making decision making, you are based in short term, maximum, mid term, let's say vision. So it has to do with what I need to do now and to show to my citizens now in order to win the election, the next, I don't know, mandate or the next uh, three years, five years or four years of a mandate. So it's somehow influencing uh, this people decision making during the election to get another mandate to govern. So, yeah, it's a power centered, uh, centered, let's say, um, uh, approach and, uh, and, vi and, and vision. So it's quite uh, difficult or even impossible, especially for young democracy countries and definitely quite impossible for authoritarian, uh, authoritarian regimes to let go of the political power, which is uh, in the same time uh, accompanied with economic power. Thinking in long term needs uh, political will and a lot of compromises. Uh, needs um, people and politics in one country, in one nation, need to think beyond their own interests and beyond their next, uh, winning the next, uh, next elections. So definitely needs a little bit of will to let go uh, in the thinking of how can I win the next mandate, but thinking even what I need to do now, even though the results of my reforms doesn't show in four years, but it has a long vision and it's good for the humanity. It's good for our um, our nation. When I'm saying it needs political will, all political parties in one country need to come agreed and to say that, yeah, these certain reforms are necessary and doesn't matter what I'm thinking politically and what is my vision as a, politi a political party, all the political uh, engaged parties need to come agree that what is better for our nation, then they need to, let's say, be coherent and consistent, even though uh, the power is changed, so political power is changed in once in four years, some politics and some strategies need to go and need, um, and everybody need to be persistent on this. Um, Secondly, when I'm thinking it's much more or how we can become much more centered oriented in, you know, with a world order, we need to think a little bit much more beyond the nation. So in one country or in one uh, uh, state, we need to think much more regionally and uh, yeah, definitely globally. Because one state or one nation cannot do it alone. And what we are living now and how we are living now is the real example that how much is important that regionally, worldwide, we need to cooperate all together to fight this uh, terrible pandemic which uh, reshaped completely our, our lives. So um, I do believe, and now maybe everybody is seeing how much is important to work together, even the importance of the international organizations. I'm referring here as an example, all UN family organizations or EU uh, as Albania is a part of um, a Balkan region, but uh, still not yet a member uh, in European Union. How much importance do we have this kind of organizations? Because at the end of the day, what's their role? Somehow they need to get, I think, much more power from national politics or politicians and to transform this in much more human and environmental centered uh, worldwide. This is requiring yeah, very organized, competent and strong organizations to take this role and act accordingly. They need to be bold and timely to take the decision making for the betterment of all. We need definitely models. Uh, right recommendations and real actions based uh, upon the acceptance of uh, all uh, countries which adhere to these organizations. So somehow it's difficult for one political power, what, one governing political power to really do not to think uh, nationwide. It's their duty to think about their civilians, about their citizens. But at the same time, once a country is, uh, let's say, accepting uh, to be part of this or one international organization, then this international organization must have, let's say, the power to really think beyond boundaries, beyond the nation. So to think much more universally and uh, to get a little bit of power uh, from this national govern governments and uh, act upon uh, the global or humanity will. 
One example can be, for example, COVAX facility, which WHO is organizing with uh, member countries to really supply with vaccines, even though it's not yet efficient, even though yet not all the countries that adhere in this COVAX uh, facility did not receive yet the vaccines, uh, the anti the anti COVID vaccine, but still. Um, it shows that um, in these conditions, and whenever we do have a threat, especially this pandemic threat or environmental threat or um, flooding or earthquake, these require a very much, a much more uh, uh, human decision making rather than politic oriented. So, sure. uh, um, yeah, this All is right. the interjection that I wanted to share. Uh, the chairman of the Masood Foundation joining us from Afghanistan and offer him uh, the stage to, to give us his thoughts on getting beyond power politics. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, thank you for inviting me here. I'm sorry that before the electricity was cut, of course, this is Kabul, Afghanistan, and that <laughs> happens sometimes. So I did not follow really. I just lately just followed uh, what our colleagues say. Uh, but let me say my view about what I read here. Uh, I do really think that um, uh, the topic that is given, getting behind power politics, especially in today's world, uh, it seems very difficult because the way we can see here in Afghanistan is more to do with ethical politics or political ethic because that's very, very important. Unfortunately, in today's world, we do not see much of that one. Uh, we somehow see that the politics is led by uh, ethics and uh, but at the same time the ethics is led by politics so those types that ethics is led by politics so then whatever you do it means the, the, the unjustified the means whatever you do you can let's say in Afghanistan you can use the terrorism to really get to whatever you want here Let's say at the moment we do have in Afghanistan many groups of terrorists, and we see the involvement of many countries in these groups. And instead of really kind of putting the kind of red line that this is inhuman, their act is human, we should really kind of condemn them. We should fight against them. But then on the contrary, they do kind of see the advantage to use these uh, inhuman tools for killing humans. And mm. it's not the same. Let's say that when I, when I when we see back, when we look back, let's say to the world and the Western world, that's not happening there. But when we see their foreign policy, much of them, that's happening here in Afghanistan, or likewise in many countries like Afghanistan, that's happening, unfortunately. So therefore, not much kind of ethical politics is left here, or political ethics. So, so, so long as we really do not cross beyond that one, uh, I don't think if we can really kind of see this sort of culture, which... Uh, uh, my colleague, she, she described, we don't see the sort of culture like that. It's, I mean, at least this is the way we can see in Afghanistan here, that we are living here. I, I really do think that uh, it, before anything, before we really go to the rules and regulation and the, the way the politics is played, if we really concentrate on how exactly is our uh, political culture, how exactly we can see the world, how exactly we should cross that one, how exactly we can really kind of use the ethics instead of politics to justify the means. So if we do that one, then we can cross them. If we don't do that one, if you really kind of wait for the rules and regulation, how to really play that one, then of course those who really make the rules like that, they are themselves kind of uh, somehow misled. So it's not kind of uh, enlightenment for us. Very, very interesting. Thank you for those comments. Um, I, I noticed that uh, Danilo uh, Turk, are, are you on? Are you available? Yeah, there, there you are. Yes. Great. Well, welcome. We're very yeah. glad to have you. <laughs> would, would welcome your thoughts. Yes, I apologize for coming in late. I was uh, in another meeting until 15 minutes ago. <laughs> well, that's great. Glad you were able to make it. Um, all right, I don't know if this is my turn now. I would be happy to say a few words and say how yes, happy please. I am to be. Yeah, sure. Well, 
clearly this is a very important and um, uh, how should I say a challenging subject getting beyond power politics. Now we live at a moment where power politics seems to be as dominant as ever. I mean, I don't remember any recent uh, period in politics when power was less relevant than today. Uh, if one looks simply at what's happening today, uh, you know, the uh, American Chinese meeting in Alaska, clearly about power politics, uh, Russian reaction to, to the interview by President Biden, another example of power politics. So we see power politics as a very dominant feature of the world today. Now, obviously, one needs to be optimistic. Uh, one needs to keep uh, hope that this is not the final uh, definition of what international uh, system should be about. And um, since my experience has been for last 40 years or so, closely related to the United Nations, I keep thinking about the United Nations as a place where power politics can be tamed to some extent, where it could be, where the sharp edges can be can be softened, where you know communication is more important than power not always, sometimes, and uh, where optimism is inherent in the constitution of the, of, of the system. So uh, we have to think about um, how to bring the international heavily power-defined stage to another one where trust will be stronger, although I, never, I don't think that trust will ever be the fundamental, uh, the fundamental um, feature or fundamental principle. Now, there are two types of tasks that I see in, uh, in this context. One is uh, related to specific activities of today, for example, the whole uh, activity around vaccines and global problem of debt, debt relief, debt restructuring for the future, and uh, special drawing rights, if one talks about the um, International Monetary Fund. So there are specific tasks which have to be given the highest, the highest level of priority today. And I really uh, would like to plead for uh, vaccine-related work to move from the profit vaccine to people's vaccine. I mean, because right now, uh, profit and power seem to be dominant in this in this uh, whole discussion. So, I mean, there are specific tasks which which are quite fundamental now. And if we think. has to be a priority. And then there is another another more general level of international discussion which must not be neglected. And that is to bring the, the whole set of international relations uh, from the current power struggles to a point where reason and uh, reliability prevails reason and reliability. This is not completely alien to the international system. And reason and reliability are expressed in the norms of international law. Now, this, of course, is something that matures over time. It is not happening overnight. It's, it's really a process. And if one thinks today about um, needs for future international regulation, one can draw some courage or some hope from the past experiences where international law really helped create diplomatic law, uh, diplomatic and consular relations, uh, law of the sea and many other areas. Today, I think we are lagging behind in some important areas such as, in particular, uh, 
artificial intelligence and internet where the international uh, regulation is lacking uh, this is not by coincidence this is not a technological necessity this came as a result of deliberate choice of that choice and I think the time has come to think very seriously about regulation of internet and and artificial intelligence more generally if one wants to build uh, an international community this is, that is not based on power politics but rather on trust this is a more long-term task but an important one so these are my comments that I wanted to make today and thank you for your attention of course too. Thank you. Um, and I, you know, I, I guess I want to ask all of our panelists, because I think you bring up a great point regarding artificial intelligence. And, you know, we live in an age in which not just AI, but a number of other different technologies are proliferating around the world or are beginning to affect our societies and our economies and our polities. And I, I do wonder how, how one begins that conversation. How do you get sort of a sense of um, common objectives when it comes to AI? How does that come, or any technology? I, it seems to me that this is one of the big dynamics of our age is that these technologies are, are changing so much about our lives and it's important that there be norms and standards around their use. But I don't know, is that a, is that a conversation that happens at the UN level or is it does it start with nation states or how do we get to a point where we can agree upon what those norms should look like? And I would ask, uh, Sunita, are you still on, Sunita? Yes, I'm, uh, I'm hearing you. Yeah, when we are talking about uh, yeah. artificial intelligence, um, I guess not. It's, uh, Danilo, are you, are you still, I, I can only see you, so I think there's a technical issue here. So <laughs> any thoughts? Do you hear me? Hello? Yes, I do. We do. Yeah, we so, do. Yeah. It's okay? You're okay? It's, yeah. uh, it's okay. okay. I, I, I can only see you, Danilo. So um, do you have any, yeah. any thoughts on you know, what the process is to get into agreement on norms? Um. I do believe that it's quite uh, difficult, but not not impossible in the stage that we with that we are now. What I see how government, if you are you know sticking to the theme, how government can use technology, it's definitely to be much more accountable and much more transparent. And in the same time, governments can use or may use this technology or even artificial intelligence to collect data but uh, to make faster decision making from one sense uh, from one side and uh, the right decision uh, decision making uh, the technology yes it uh, has its own let's say down terms so when it talk when we are talking about privacy and uh, other data which uh, can be kind of uh, yeah, difficult uh, to manage but when we are talking about uh, government decision making and politics uh, um, each each of us and any 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 country uh, has to use it on the benefit of the people to make fast decision making and to be much more accounting and much more participative, uh, participating politics. So when we are talking or, you know, uh, directly answering to your questions, if we can agree to have kind of a one norm or uh, kind of a setting uh, regulations, yes, you, I know that uh, it's, um, it has its own commissioner and its own norms and the regulations. But each of the countries, at the end of the day, has its own, let's say, independency, what to choose, and uh, yeah, uh, how uh, how you make your own decision, except of the aki and which, let's say, are norms and regulations and laws, which you need to uh, to bind once you are a member of European Union. For the rest, each of the country is kind of um, yeah independent how you are using the data and uh, how you are using the artificial intelligence. But definitely, yeah, what we are doing now, if it wasn't for the, uh, let's say, uh, technology, 
all of our lives and all of our working nowadays since uh, beginning of 2020 would be stopped. So definitely government, parliaments, decision making are using technology in order to push things forward to make the decision and to run, uh, to run, to run the country, to run the government or to run the, uh, the companies. Yeah. It has a right. downtime uh, because, yeah, once you are not protected, then it has to do then with uh, protection, has to do with what you are saying and the liberty of who is saying what is saying. And definitely it, it can have even kind of a distortion of information. Who has much more power can give much more, let's say, voice to his own ideas and to his own, let's say, decision making. So definitely I agree with you when you are saying that we need some norms and some regulations in order to really uh, yeah, uh, preserve what we need to preserve and especially human rights and uh, human uh, and, uh, and privacy. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Akhmad, <clears throat> uh, what are your thoughts on, on, on sort of getting gaining consensus on norms about important global issues, whether it's technology or others? Um, how, how do we go about doing that? Uh, well, the way why you can see that, although we have been connected uh, with each other through technology right now, but in real term, in real life, we are so much disconnected from each other and real life. What I'm trying to say is that what at the moment we are discussing is two different worlds that we are discussing. For example, as uh, my, we are talking, you are talking about the use of technology in there, in that world, we can see here that although the use of technology here inside in Afghanistan, it has been useful, but at the same time, it has not really kind of, did have a very kind of, a very positive impact on our society because the thing is that the way that we can see is that, for example, the internet, the TV, the technology, the news is coming here. It's not compatible with the culture of the people. So it does have the kind of very direct effect on the culture of the people because uh, at the moment kind of people here kind of we are copying. It's not that we are kind of initiating something. We're copying something. It has really kind of grown some sort of laziness here that the world, I mean, our people are not kind of benefiting. Although, of course, it has really increased the voice of the people. It has really increased the kind of uh, the rights of the people to claim for that. But, but at the same time, in many fields, especially in identity field and cultural field and economic field even, it did not have kind of very positive impact here like that. Or, for example, we can see that technology here, it has really kind of helped those populist politicians so much that in fact, in fact, instead of really kind of going to really serve the people themselves, all the time they are kind of using technology as a tool to promote themselves without really kind of serving. It's com com so much different now, let's say, compared to the past 20 years or 30 years, when we did not have much of this technology, that the politician really kind of went along the people and helped the people and really they wanted to kind of take some sort of uh, favoriteness from serving the people. But today, that, that is not the case. They are sitting in their room, they are sitting in their home, they are kind of using the technology, they are kind of promoting themselves as a populist politician like that, they are gaining without even serving a thing for the people themselves. So, in fact, what happened that although we know that the use of technology or the benefit of such thing is a huge... middle class people even higher like that. But in Afghanistan, that is not the case, unfortunately, because mm -hmm. on one side, it's our government, on the other side, it's our culture, but at the same time, that we do not have much of this communication with the rest of the world to see how exactly we can get, uh, we can use this sort of tools to kind of enhance the, 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 the life of the people. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a great perspective. It, you know, uh, technology is, uh, is not necessarily either good nor bad. It's how it's deployed and how it's used. And sometimes it can be used in ways that are, like you say, incompatible with the culture. And that doesn't build trust. It builds probably the opposite. Uh, Danilo, on this issue of, of technology and uh, how we can either uh, use technology to build trust or how we can build norms around its use, what, 
you, you sort of brought up AI. What, what, what do you see as the opportunities here? Well, um, I shouldn't uh, suggest anything excessively optimistic at this point because the tendencies are not going in the direction of, you know, uh, improvement, really. What we see is uh, are tendencies which uh, lead to fragmentation of cyberspace, uh, and then regulations um, uh, emerging within this um, uh, fragmented landscape. So, you know, there is no reason for optimism here. Nevertheless, one needs to, to try. And I, I see two approaches which are possible. One is based on the experience so far. There has been uh, at least something done in the past decades. For example, the Internet Governance Forum, which obviously you may consider to be weak, to be sectoral only, uh, which may not be a particularly solid basis for, for further work. But this is something that was done. And there have been discussions in the United Nations uh, about um, uh, cyberspace and regulation uh, that have been going on for some time now. And of course, one can build on that basis and figure out what does the experience show and what's realistically possible. That's a more cautious approach. A more ambitious approach would be based on the um, uh, recent pronouncements in the United Nations, which really call for stronger involvement in a legal regulation of the areas where that legal regulation has been lacking so far. Now, the UN Secretary General is expected to produce a report this year in which he has to propose certain priority activities at, you know, the global level. And that, by its very nature, could involve the uh, uh, work on artificial intelligence. If one looks at the, uh, the non-governmental sphere and uh, you know, the well-meaning expert uh, work, uh, one can clearly see very interesting proposals already going as far as to suggesting a kind of a global um, uh, Bretton Woods for artificial intelligence. That was proposed by very prominent um, specialists, including from MIT and from other centers of uh, intellectual and technological excellence. So there are bold proposals there. The question is, uh, can the Secretary General of the United Nations realistically build on this kind of a bold uh, and and uh, you know uh, innovative approach. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure about that, but these two options are open: either to build yeah. on what has been done so far, and that's not satisfactory, but can be improved, or start with something new, something bold, for which various uh, initiatives already exist. Great. Well, thank thanks for that. This is what I, I can I'm say for now. <laughs> okay. Well, we have about three minutes left, so what I thought. I would do is uh, just ask each, each of our panelists to offer one sort of final thought on how to build this trust and whether it's collaboration uh, between governments or between government and civil society or uh, other organizations. I think just, just a very high level, one minute each to kind of take us out one last thing that everyone should take away from this, this discussion about a trust centered world. And Sunita, we'll, we'll start with you. I think you're on mute. I think you're on mute. Okay. Sunita, I think you're on mute. There we go. No, it's okay, Sorry. I think. So I was yeah. saying in one minute to make a conclusion about how to gain or how to create trust. And uh, yeah, uh, it's quite challenging indeed. 
Um, definitely, once you work or when you enter in politics and works for people and uh, in your vision and in your own objectives is to to do to do better with uh, to do yeah in what in your field of expertise to give your best and to do better for a target group or interested group, be as much as accountable that you can be and much more transparent. I mean, uh, to create trust, you need to stay with people, to talk to people, to be open to people, even to say that uh, I'm sorry when you did something uh, that is not, uh, you know, uh, not the right decision, to accept when you make even uh, mistakes and then to go on and to improve your own mistakes and to be a better politician, a better government for the sake of your country and uh, invest a lot in youth and education in order to be it much more inclusive as you can. That's great, thank you, thank you, Ak Akmad. Thank you. Well, I really do believe that I have to stick with my, what I said at the beginning, that yeah. uh, what really makes a better society, especially in politics, is to go for a kind of virtuous politics, that if we can follow the ethical politics or political ethics, so then if uh, we can really kind of invest on uh, human capital, on human itself, then of course we can make the society better like that. For example, when the COVID came, we can see that the whole world felt it that way. So the, if the world feels that even the politics do have the same impact as COVID on every human being across the world, then of course we can bring this feeling together and then we can have a shared vision how exactly we can really implement politics, how exactly we can cross these, uh, what you call, power politics to something that we can see the humanity as one, kind of crossing the whole boundaries of religion, race, and this and that, the whole thing. And if we can see that one, then, of course, uh, we will be able to go for uh, what was in the real subject, to go from, to, to, to cross beyond the power politics to a kind of new vision for the whole humanity. That's a great vision, and um, I don't, I don't know if Danilo is still on. Uh, I don't see him on, so uh, we are right at time. So I, I like finishing with that, a, a fairly optimistic, uh, hopeful tone of a new vision uh, to think more about humanity rather than about our local communities and, and uh, the borders and boundaries that separate us. So I think that's a great message to 